well it looks like 12 hours of driving all the way from Pittsburgh to Michigan here has paid off pulling up to my friend Ed's house I've never actually met Ed in person before he's a fellow preservationist as I like to call it more than a collector he's doing an awesome job of preserving the sport and uh, the memorabilia of the past days of mixed martial arts and uh, I think yeah, here he is right now. Ed. Charlie, how you doing? So Ed nice Tyson. to meet nice you to in person. You. Finally able awesome, to meet you. Awesome, man. Great. It's good to see you. Yeah, Always nice over you too. the phone and so forth. Finally yeah. in person. Man, I love oh, it yeah. out here. Great view. Yeah, you picked a good day to travel to Kingsford, Michigan. 12 hours worth of We get uh, some UFC and MMA it. and it'll be worth it. I know, man. I'm, I'm no, I can't wait to see what you got, man. Where yeah. do you got it all hiding? We got it all hidden downstairs. Come on in. Let's do it, man. All right. The whole shit about legacy and and uh, and, and make you leave leave something behind. No, nobody even knows who the fuck Sugar Ray Leonard is nowadays. There is no legacy. When you're done, you're done. When you ain't when you ain't fighting, you ain't fighting. No one's remembering you. No one gives a fuck. It doesn't matter what you had, what you did, what you won. It doesn't it doesn't mean shit. When you're done, you're done. If you want to stay in the game, you got to be in the game. You got to be fighting. It's that simple. You know what I mean? That's a fact. There's no legacy. There's no bullshit. There's no. There's no. There, there's no nothing. If you ain't fighting, if you ain't in the cage, you have nothing coming up. You you you're done. You're out. And that, that's the reality of it. Uh, that's what she was telling me about. Yeah, that's my check uh, that Steve Jenna won in uh, UFC 3. So cool. Came in as an alternate and uh, ended up winning the $60,000 cash prize. That's like another one-of-a-kind item that wow. I was very happy to be able to get. And that also came from a collector friend of mine uh, out that's, in San Diego. That's phenomenal. I love what it says, for being the best. For being the best. So yeah. cool. Well, Steve Jenna was the best that night. That's awesome, man. He won the prize. 1997. Um, that was the first time that I actually got to see an Ultimate Fighting Championships. I heard about it in the past and, you know, obviously would see flyers or ads on television or whatnot. And I had this idea from, I guess, what I was hearing the little bit I did, that it was just as brutal uh, sport and it was just sheer violence. Um, but the interesting thing is I grew up watching pro wrestling and pro wrestling was in that era, in the 80s, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, it was just all these different personalities. And I remember them doing all these crazy submissions, you know, the figure four leg lock and the back breakers and the bust and crabs. And I used to say, what if that was real? Like, there's got to be like something that would really hurt. Even knowing as a kid, like there's got to be, this got to be real. That guy would really be hurting. And, and then I started watching the Ultimate Fighting Championships and it changed everything. I was like, whoa, this, this is real. Now, the first time I had heard about the UFC was actually probably from UFC 1. I didn't see it, but I was at work and a guy was talking about it. This was back in 1993, I think in October. And he was just talking about how he was watching an event where guys were actually punching in the face and kicking in the face. And, you know, I was just thinking it was just pro wrestling, just another version of pro wrestling. And I, I said, is it real? I mean, this is for real? And he said, yeah, this is for real. And I still didn't believe him. So then I think the next event was UFC 2, probably a few months later. And uh, we got UFC 2 and it was just amazing what we were seeing. I mean, it was, was real. These guys were kicking each other in the face. I mean, bloody. I mean, this was not pro wrestling. I mean, this was exactly what we were hoping for in reality. Two things we want to see, or we see and we, we want to change that. First thing is, show me one second, when you guys hold in the fence, I just talk to, to some guys. When you start, you're, you're good, you're small. So I make my combination, everything's good. But when, then when I start holding, you square up again. So then he does the one, two, three. Look, I cannot count them now. That's why I need to be in the position the whole time, the same, same movement. Here, he makes one, two, three. I'm ready to counter. You see, now I get one, two, three. It's it small. Bop, bop, bop. And he's ready to counter. Bop, bop, 
Stop. Not here. I do this. One, two, three. Look. Now I'm doing this. Square up. How can I? Can I count it? That's one thing. Another thing is, we deliver shot. I ask you guys to make this little dip. Why? If I make a one, two, three, and I make this one, and I go here with my liver. Look. If he hits me now, me, I'll be all, all over the place. But. When I do one, two, three, and I do this and he hits me now, I'm strong. Nothing happens here, I'm strong. I can't tell hidden. This here is the canvas from UFC 30. Uh, this is actually the very first Zufa owned event of the UFC after they purchased the UFC from SEG. Evan Tanner fought Tito Ortiz for the main event of UFC 30. And this is a very valuable part of UFC history and it's sitting right here in my garage in Kingsford, Michigan. I was always a collector, like I started out as a kid collecting baseball cards, just like most kids did, then it went into football, and then I started collecting game used jerseys, baseball bats, things like that. So probably around 2006, 2007, something like that, I started noticing uh, MMA items were coming up for sale, you know, on uh, eBay and on public media. So. You know, and it was a pretty new sport still, so I, I just started buying posters and programs, different things like that. But then I started thinking, boy, getting fight used items would be something that should be preserved. And because like these guys are, you know, out there battling and, and when they get done, you know, if they get a second fight, third fight, that's one thing. But some of them are only around one time. No more, no more humble, no more. Everything is finished. <laughs> Salam alaikum, my brother. <laughs> alaikum. You, you gonna beg me? I'll beg you, inshallah. I'll do anything you want. Hey, please, come clean my house. <laughs> anything you want. Hey. Anything you want. You want me to wrestle bear? I'll wrestle bear. <laughs> no, this is impossible. You cannot wrestle with bear. This is an old uh, sign that would, would have been hung on the window of a VHS or video store, you know, and that's from UFC 1. So that's kind of a rare piece. Yeah, I've but, actually never seen that piece before. Yeah, I, that's, that's the really only cool. time I've ever seen. These are old DVDs where they, the they laser the full-size laser discs. Yeah, those are really hard to come by. Yeah. Actually, I've seen them before, but they're really hard Some to find. Some of them are signed and everything. I got another one over here from Battlecade Extreme Fighting. We got the Mickey Big Mouth beers back there. They made uh, six different ones. If you want to be a real tough guy, you could get the temporary. Tattoos from oh, yeah. too. I wasn't tough enough, so I just kept them. <laughs> just stored them there. So once I started getting into the MMA memorabilia, I thought it'd be a good idea to start getting into the fight used uh, memorabilia. And I got into shoes. It started out with the Tank Abbott Ultimate Ultimate 95 shoes. That was actually the first, I believe, the first piece of fight used memorabilia that I got. And then from there, just I went after everything that I could possibly find and end up getting Mark Coleman fight use shoes, Mark Coleman fight use shorts, gloves, uh, Tito Ortiz items, Chuck Liddell items, Townsend Saunders, Saunders items, right? just, just various things like even masks jacket from Tap Out. I mean, anything that one of these guys had used or worn or you know anything like that is an interesting item to me. and. Uh, I feel it's necessary to preserve uh, these items for future uh, fans of this great sport that we all love. Obviously, you've been around so many fighters, been in so many big moments yourself, especially championship moments. When it comes to Vulcan in this moment, if there's anything you would tell them right now, what would it be? Uh, just to enjoy the process. You know, uh, this is something Vulcans, you know, not Vulcan, but all fighters dream about since they're a little kid. And, you know, the, the moment's gonna arrive here in a few days and just take a deep breath, sit back and enjoy the process, embrace the process and recognize that you've earned the right to, to be in this, this position that you're in and uh, just to take the full advantage of it, you know? These are the very first VHS tapes from the SEG era of the UFC, one through like 29. And then they, they would come out with these little box sets that they would sell after events. I, I think I remember them advertising to buy these and they had secrets of the octagon, you know, which are kind of cool. I just like all the colors and everything with them. They really display very cool. This is uh, this is what happens when you have a bad night in the UFC. Uh, this was 
probably the most, one of the most infamous injuries ever in the UFC, Tim Sylvia versus Frank Mir. Uh, at first everyone thought it was a bad stoppage. Uh, Frank Mir got Tim in a really, really deep arm bar and instead of it being on the elbow, he had it more on the forearm and actually snapped Tim's arm in half. This is a Johnny Hendrick uh, walkout t-shirt along with the uh, shorts that he wore in his fight night victory over I believe TJ Wahlberger and this was his payout through Zufa check for $55,000 for his uh, victory and then I think he got knockout of the night as well. How did you get the check? Well I bought this uh, through a site a few years ago and that check I didn't even know it was actually going to be included and when it came I had the check and I was happy to have it. This is probably a couple of the pieces that I think are the coolest Chuck Liddell's fight worn shorts. Uh, these are actually from UFC 37 and a half when he fought Vitor Belfort. He ended up winning that uh, decision. He knocked Belfort down. They were both in their prime at that time. And then uh, another pair, which uh, you can see how much blood is actually covering all this. Still you could clone the... Randy Couture off. You could. Of There's so much DNA. <laughs> that's UFC 57. Yeah, that's actually where uh, the third meeting between Chuck Liddell and um, Randy Couture. But uh, just you can just see, I mean, if they say a picture is worth a thousand words. You look at those shorts and how much of a lifetime went into those and the blood uh, literally soaking it. You know, these guys are really these guys are artists, right? They're martial artists and they're going into this octagon and literally uh, performing on their canvas, right? And this is what the, the cost is sometimes. Uh, that's the cape that Scott Ferrazzo used as a walk-in type cape to his fight in UFC 8. And on the other side it says fear me and, and on this side it just shows I believe that's supposed to be him because it kind of looks like a little pit bull tearing out. His nickname was Scott the Pitbull Ferrazzo. Oh, shit. How are you feeling tonight? It's the bad part of the job. It's the bad part. You know, last fight I came out unscathed, but not every fight is like that. Some fights, you come out looking like this, cut on your face. Cut on your lip, bloody lip, bloody nose. It happens. It's part of the job. On to the next one. These old pictures right here. Yeah, these are the pictures of this banner right here that you see. This banner was used in the backdrop for UFC 13 when Joe was uh, interviewing Tito and maybe some other fighters as well. And then there was a rules meeting in UFC 14. And right there is uh, Art Davies, the co-creator of the UFC, and Big John McCarthy. You can see the banner in the background of all those pictures, and that's this banner here. That's it's crazy. a one-of-a-kind, heavy-duty, nice cloth banner. But as long as he's continuing to sweat, we're fine. So some guys, like for Brad, for example, with Tavares, we'll, we'll actually do a workout and, and initiate the sweating process. And then once he feels like he's kind of getting tired of working out or hitting pads, because he's low on carbs or anything or getting tired, then we'll head back to the room and, and start the start maybe in the bath. So I think it's just a matter of preference. Some guys prefer the sauna, some guys like the tub, some guys like to just, you know, get a workout on, get a sweat, get on the treadmill, and possibly mummy or a combination of all three. You know, so it's never a fun process, but you gotta try to make it the best to keep your mind off of it. These are just some more shirts right here, like very early SEG era shirts. This is another uh, ref shirt. Uh, from John McCarthy. Over here we have an interesting sweatshirt. This was given me, given to me by Ron Van Cleef. They called him the Black Dragon. He was in like Kung Fu karate type movies in the 70s. He actually trained for UFC 1 and he must have had this sweatshirt made. But he, he fought uh, Hoist Gracie in UFC 1. He ended up fighting him with a broken ankle. He didn't do really good, but uh, just to get in there and at 40, I think he was like 49 years old or something like that was pretty amazing. Probably the most famous belt that you'll ever kind of see is the UFC. This is a real deal championship belt. You can see the little bit of patina on it. I was uh, fortunate enough to get this off a fighter that uh, I know and uh, he knows what uh, how important our mission is, and he was willing to part with this for us. Um, 
so we were able to acquire this from him. Um, extremely heavy belt. It's not one of the replicas like they make now. Uh, real crystals and everything. Uh, just recently I acquired the tap out seats from the tap out theater out in California. The Tony Stewart uh, race car part. And then this tap out jacket that was actually owned by Charles Lewis Jr. who was, was called Mask. He was the uh, co-creator of the tap out uh, clothing line. Well, an interesting story is like last year I was on Craigslist and I happened to find an ad where somebody was selling some artifacts that they thought were worn by mask so of tap out. So I contacted the guy and learned that he had had a jacket, a hat, and then uh, he had these little necklace urns. So he sent me some pictures of them and he had eight of them. And I remembered seeing those necklace urns uh, on Scrape one time when I saw him at a UFC out in Las Vegas. So I looked into it and found out that uh, there was like 10 of these little necklace urns made and they all contained some of uh, Mask's ashes. Well, apparently there was some sort of lawsuit between uh, the family of Mask and, and some of the guys from Tap Out and they ended up having to they, were, they had given eight of the 10 away, kept uh, punk ass and scrape, kept theirs, but they had given on to like very close friends, the other eight of masks away, but they ended up getting sued and had to recover them. So one of the family members got the uh, urns back and ended up putting them in a storage unit, which I thought, thought was kind of different, but uh, they ended up for closing on the storage unit and the person that I got them from ended up buying the storage unit and they were in that storage unit which he later sold to me. So I ended up finding the 8 out of 10 little urn necklaces that contain masks ashes. So I contacted Scrape and I met with him and uh, gave them back to him and he was nice enough uh, to send me one of, uh, or actually gave me in person this jacket that was actually worn and owned by Mask and then these theater seats uh, right from their theater and then this part from Tony Stewart's car with their old logo on it. We really appreciated that and uh, these are some of the items that tell that story and will for sure and find their way into the museum someday. And obviously I'm a clothing company which is um, based in the sports athletics meaning kind of like like a Nike would be you know uh, when I created the company and what it was it was created out of a out of a need we were here we were me and a bunch of friends of mine and and we were training in the garage and and loved this new sport that we saw that was underground mixed martial arts but there was nothing that you could wear that would identify with that you know what I mean if you wanted to be soccer you could put on Adidas if you wanted to pretend you were Michael Jordan or something you'd get Nike and but for mixed martial arts there was there was nothing so you know kind of being a kid that was based a lot in fantasy, you know, maybe I took a, a logo that, that uh, a name which I thought was synonymous with the sport, which would be tap out, you know, I, and then I kind of just, you know, wanted the feeling of it to be like you feel when you put on something that you're proud of, whether if you're in, if you're in the Marines or you're in law enforcement, you law enforcement, you put on your outfit, you know you're in charge. If you're a fireman, you put on an outfit, you know you're there to save the day, save people, and I just wanted to, you know, maybe, for lack of a better word, maybe if you put on tap out, you know, maybe feel a little like superhero, like you were tough. At least you were about the sport, which was, you know, had a lot to do with alpha males and, and, and fighting. And I always wanted it to be that. So I took a logo and hopefully it captured a feeling and, and embraced a sport that was an underdog. The fighters were underdogs. They weren't looked at as real athletes. I believe they are, and here's a guy that didn't go to college to be um, some clothing designer or anything, but just wanted to believe in a sport and in athletics, and therefore making myself an underdog. So, sport needed a hero, someone that wasn't afraid to stand up and, and represent it, and hopefully Tap Out's done that. And we just happen to do it through clothing and a lot of um, face paint. <laughs> This one here is probably my favorite piece that I have in my collection. Uh, I've become really good friends with Don Fry, and um, Don had his fight in Pride 19, uh, Bad Blood, with Ken Shamrock. And this was actually the trophy 
that he was awarded that night when he beat Ken Shamrock. It was kind of the last of the old era of fighters with Ken Shamrock and Don Fry fighting. And uh, Don won that night, and I'm super happy to have that from uh, a really good friend of mine. You know, I think a lot of people really, if they don't understand mixed martial arts, or maybe they don't understand collecting, um, I think the way we're trying to put this together is this isn't about just collecting. This isn't about just a sport. This is about human beings and a path that they've been on in their life and getting to uh, this place and what it's taken to get to this place. We all have a journey in this life. We all have this the struggles that we have to deal with, whether you work at, at a retail store, uh, you're a lawyer or you're a doctor, everyone goes through these phases in their life to get to that point and that goal of what they're working towards. And everyone can relate to that. Yeah. And these fighters do this their whole life. And there's so many people and coaches and trainers that get them to this place in this life. And we look at it as a fight. We look at it as this one time thing, but there's a fight, there's a struggle the whole way to get to that one moment they step inside that cage or they step inside that ring their whole life to that moment and just like when somebody walks uh, you know to their graduation and they got their doctor degree or somebody maybe gets promoted and, and gets a job as a CEO of a company they worked at for 20 years this is the culmination of a life's work in their respected field they just happen to be fighters and it's not just one fight and then it's done. This is a lifetime work that we're watching. And it's sad that once that work uh, is per se accomplished, once their fighting career is over, it's not accomplished. It's a, it has to be carried on as a legacy because the past always paves the way for the future. Yeah. So every time there's a new event, it's just giving respect to the past of these guys that made it.